So what does it really take to be successful in War and Order? How can you compete with everybody on top? How can you be in, a, in an alliance that wins the, uh, the crown and, and does really well in an event? And how can you do really well in those as well um, and get the rewards and everything that the people on the top can get? Hey guys, this is Heretic and in this video, I'm gonna go over 15 secrets to being successful in War and Order. But before I get started, if you're a fan of War and Order and of mobile gaming in general, then you're in the right place. I release between three and five different videos a week. So click the like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and most importantly, share the video with your friends. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so number one, and these are in no particular order, but number one thing that you can do to be successful, and this is more in the beginning of the game, things you should think about. One thing that people don't really focus on because you know you, you look at my guide and you look at all these different guides out there and they say to focus on your artifacts, right? But one thing that they don't say, they don't mention is your actual Lord skills. So getting your Lord XP. Lord XP is very underrated at the beginning because what you're getting are small things like small you know upgrades each level but the focus of the game and to me when the game really begins is once you get up here to a skill called SOS battle SOS and so once you get this you're able to do a f basically a free attack every day you're gonna have wounded so it's not completely free but you can attack anyone and if you're strong enough, you can actually send them over their hospital cap and kill some of their troops without the fear of losing, you know, of any of your troops actually dying. So, you know, the Lord XP is very underrated at the beginning. You can do a lot of things to get Lord XP. It's something that's available in most of the shops. Look, look here in the for example in the infinite war shop it's here you know and i get it as much as i can it's also available in the star ruin shop yeah go ahead and grab that now while we're here but lord xp is very underrated from the very beginning so once you do get sos a lot of people actually stop and they shouldn't um, they should keep on pushing until they get to 45 so that they can get slaughter, which on every attack, um, troops that would have been wounded would actually die. So having that's also really important when you're at war. All right. Number two, while we're over here, Star Ruins. Star Ruins is where you actually test all of your battle formations. So as you go through and you're looking at all these guides and you're kind of fit, you're talking to people and you're figuring out, you know, what troop type, like you're going to pick between mages and archers. You're going to pick between infantry and cav eventually. You're going to want to know like what formation, like how many of each tier level and all of that you should send out. Star Ruins is the place that you want to test all of this. So once you get beyond the beginner mine, you'll get to, you know, the three, four, five mines. And within here, you can actually pick someone and you can plunder them. So this is an attack. So you can send out your, your actual battle formations. So if I want to do something like that, just send this out just as an example. So you can send out this formation and you can test how it does and then you can adjust it and you get two free every day. So you can do this two times a day. If you get nothing else, and the Star Ruins is super important, by the way, but 
if you do nothing else, at least you're able to test how your troops are doing um, against other people and your actual formations that you send out so you can kind of get it to, to where it needs to be to get the most out of the, the tech and the troops that you have. The other thing, the other reason that you want to do this every single day without missing, you get these, um, the, you have these quests every single day. So you have gather, just gathering in any um, deep load. You get, you get the uh, burst stone cr chest. And then if you occupy or plunder anyone in any um, star uh, source mine, um, you'll actually get one of these burst stone crystals, which will allow you to choose any of the zodiacs that you need. And that's super helpful. And I'll show you. So this is just from gathering up here. And I use them, you know, when I, when I need to evolve a lot of times or when I'm getting close or when I just need an extra little bump in my tech, I'll use them and I'll go down here to my other crystals that I have and I'll use this always. But I'll look and see what's close and what's going to give me the best tech that I actually need. So like I have Taurus that's close, it gives me a, a Cav HP, you know, on upgrades. It's actually at, it would, it's at actually at uh, tier two right now. I would be able to get it to two, tier three by just exchanging nine, which this helps you do. And then you can evolve that and I'll get the star power up here. And that star power is what you use to actually evolve your your artifacts. Star Ruins, it, it's probably one of the most important things that you need to do every single day as a War and Order player. I highly recommend it. Do not miss it. No matter what, don't miss it. Even on your farms, you know, any of your accounts that can use it, even these, um, the shop, the rewards that you can get from the shop, the things that you can buy, are amazing. Like I just got 10 more um, chests, but now I could get more, you know, like Lord XP. There's a lot of things that you can buy here and on a weekly basis. And this is going to help you get better. It's going to help you get your tech higher. Uh, it's going to help you with resources and it's going to help you with your beast and everything else within the game. Do the star ruins. It's super important. All right, number three. So on this one, I'm gonna show you a little video from the Savage Lands. When you're in the Savage Lands, you know, what I notice is that from the very beginning, it's all PVP. Like people are just attacking each other, speed attacking across the map, timed attacks, doing all of these things. Well, when you're doing that, you're not getting very many points. There is a time and a place for PVP in the Savage Lands. But from the very beginning, and every time they're available, you need to kill the highest level monsters that are on the map. They go from level 1 to level 3. The level 3 is going to give you the most amount of points. If you're pretty darn strong, take out those level 3s. If not, stick with the 1s and the 2s, or team up with someone in your alliance and knock out the 3s. That's how you're going to get the points. You don't have to speed... You don't even have to come out from what's under from from under your shield to, to actually get points that you can use to get good uh, rewards. So focus on the monsters. When the monsters aren't available, that's when you would want to PvP. All right. So next, the top troop type. So most people focus on, you know, really, most people at the very beginning focus on mages and infantry. That's great. But the most important troop, the best troop by far, are your angels. And your angels are here. Focus on your angels and focus on getting your dust every day from the very, very beginning. So to get dust, you would send out attacks small with a small number of troops 
those troops are going to die, but in the process you're going to get guardian power, and you can use that guardian power to build more troops. If you look at, you know, and you compare, you know, like the HP 3800 and attack 333, you look at the, the actual troops that you can make, and it, it's quite the difference. I mean, if I look at even my tier 12 Cav only has a 2,000, you know, so the angels have 3,300, 1,300 more HP. My archers, they have um, 245. You know, if we go back over here and look, 245 attack compared to 333 attack. It's, it's a pretty big difference. And a lot of people focus on their normal troop types and they forget about their angels. And they forget about, even more importantly, they forget about getting that angel dust at the very beginning. Don't let that lapse. That should be a daily thing that you do from the very beginning of the game so that you're able to actually build good angels later on, especially. You can upgrade them just like any other troop type. So you can build them and just keep building them all the way through. I highly recommend it. All right, number five, and, and this is, honestly, this is the most important thing in the game to be successful. I don't know how much of a secret it is, but, you know, you, you join the game and you, you get into an alliance and you play with that alliance and maybe there's some cool people in it, but... If that alliance doesn't have a really good activity and isn't one of the top alliances, you're kind of wasting your time if you want to be successful in the game. I understand loyalty. I understand friendships. Believe me, I've been in a lot of second and third tier alliances because of that. And the game, the enjoyment in the game is just not there as much when you can't have a lot of people on for your events. If you have, you know, 60, 70, 80 people on for events, it's a, a completely different world compared to an alliance that can only, you know, get 10, 12, 15 people on for an event. Alliance Treasure Hunt. So that's an event where it's based on spending, but from your alliance. So the more money your alliance spends, the higher level reward you can get. This is another example. In a small alliance, in an inactive alliance, the likelihood that you're gonna reach some of those high tier chests is very low. Whereas in a big alliance, in a very active alliance, you're probably gonna hit you know, the second to the last or the last one. Even if you only spend you know, if you only get 1,000 gems during the event, you'll still get those alliance rewards. And that's some of the best things that you can do to move ahead is be in an active alliance who's actually spending as a whole. And, you know, you just spend $5 and you can get really high-end rewards. And that's one. Another is, you know, you're going to do better in Elite Wars, so you're going to get more merit. You're going to do better in Fortress Wars, so you're going to get more of the badges. You're going to, do, you're going to get the, um, the crown more often and, and get those buffs. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of reasons why you want to be a part of a highly active, good alliance. That is, if you do nothing else in the game, at least experience that once. All right, number six. So, and this one's kind of funny too, and I, and I see this all the time. So you go to rankings, right? And you see this, and this is a perfect example. You see someone with, you know, that's way above everybody in battle power, or you see an alliance, you know, and you're looking through here and you're like, 
oh my god, we're in second place in, in the Alliance um, power rankings. Or, oh my god, I am, let's see, where am I? I'm, I'm way down because I just took the hit. I'm 17th in the, um, in the Lord power rankings. So I'm not as good. That's completely wrong. All that battle power is, is a number of troops. It has nothing to do with technology or how good you are. You could be a complete farm alliance and have a billion cav, um, you know, level five cav, tier five cav. And, you know, you get enough battle power from having those troops and your rank will be higher. But it's meaningless. It's pointless. Having a lot of battle power and not having the technology to back it up just makes you an easy target especially in events like frenzy and in events like void where points are involved you are going to give away a ton of points to the other realm so you don't want to do that definitely if you have the battle power you need to have the tech to back it up i would focus on the tech first and then get get the troops all right number seven if you go over to upcoming events, you'll see some things in here like um, Fortress Wars is not a good example of what I'm trying to say here. But some events will show up maybe like Savage Lands and you'll see a timer on it. And so on some of the events like Fortress War, the timer is actually going to be to sign up. But for Savage Lands, the timer is going to be for um, the end of the event. So the event will actually start, you know, during that timer. So if you're trying to plan it out with your friends, actually know when those Savage Land, um, there's three of them each time it comes up, right? So there'll be usually one around reset. There'll be one, you know, um, at 8 10 server and then there'll be another one later in the day so that all the different time zones across the world will be able to participate but knowing when those are going to happen is super important if you want to be successful because events like savage lands give you uh, really good rewards and if you follow you know the strategy of just killing the monsters not spe speeding, not spending a lot, you're still able to get really good rewards for very little effort or spending. So it's one of those events you really need to be a part of. So knowing when it's gonna happen is one of the most important parts of it. So that that's definitely um, kind of a secret there. So another, you know, number eight, another secret. So. A lot of people are gonna be very low spenders or they're gonna say, at least they're gonna say, they're free to play. If they're not actually overloading with farms, they're not gonna be successful. So if you are free to play or if you're a very low spend, um, that just means you need to make more farms. You can't be free to play and not have plenty of farms and time to actually spend on them. If you spend nothing or very little, you're gonna need to focus more on farms to keep up with building and training. Farms are separate accounts you use and keep, you know, you just keep them on um, mine nodes. You build them up, each one of them up to castle level 15. You only make calf, you don't make golems, that's gonna hurt you. You have them farming tiles all the time. And then, you know, once a day, once every other day, you have your main castle and they can't be in your alliance. They need to be in a separate alliance. Once a day or once every other day or so, send their troops away and then you attack them with your main castle and you take those resources. And, you, and that's what we call farm accounts. You need a lot of those if you are a free to play or low spend player. All right, so number nine, and, and this one is a hard one. Monitor, no matter how much you spend, if you spend it all, the amount of items you get per dollar 
that you spend is something that you need to monitor. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, they're a, you know, that person's a whale. It doesn't matter. They're going to spend a billion dollars or whatever. That's all fine. But eventually, people are going to have to slow down. And if they did this right from the beginning, they're going to feel less burnout and they're going to do, they're actually going to do better in the game. So the thing to look at is the number of the item you're going for by the dollar. So how many of, you know, how many XP do you get for $5? So this is 20,000 divided by five would be 4,000 per dollar. So you want to look at that because if you go up here, now it's, you know, 130,000 by 50. So now it's gone down, you know, quite a bit from what it was up here. So monitoring and focusing on the items you actually need, you know, which is needs to help you more in tech more than anything else. Um, divided by the dollar that you're actually spending. Monitor that. Be, you know, really, really, really focused on that so that you get the most amount for your hard-earned do dollar. Okay, another one. All right, here, number 10. When you do an SOS, you don't actually have to click and enable the battle SOS you know, and until the battle, like just before it's over. So you can attack all day. And if the attacks are easy for you and you're not gonna take losses, don't waste your SOS. Save your SOS until that castle you're attacking gets reinforced or you look and you see they have more troops than you're able to handle without taking losses. So this is a really big one, and this is one that I have to remember. I have to use a second account. That account does the scouting for me or someone else in my alliance. They'll do the scouting for me so that I know what I'm up against. Then I'll send my attack out, and if that castle is reinforced, or if I look and they're actually better than I thought, and the battle's not going the way that I, that it sh that I thought it would go, you know, I'm looking at my front line and it's taking losses, you know, and I sent out some low tier troops. That's another thing. When you send out an attack, always include some low tier, the same tier of your front line. So if you're sending out tier 10 infantry, you need to send some tier two infantry out too. And the reason that we do that is because the lower tier is going to die before the, the higher tier. So the lower tier is going to take, you know, is going to shield basically. And the lower tier is easy to replace. That's the reason we do that. But if you send out and you start to see a lot of losses, that's when you want to hit your battle SOS. You need to do it before the battle's over. That's it. All right, number 11. So I came from another game. And in that game, you know, my technology, my stats were higher than other people, most other people. So I could just go out and I could attack, you know, kind of however often as I wanted. And I really wouldn't take many losses. Well, in War and Order, it's, com it, it's very different. Now, I know if you're like way ahead of everybody else, especially later on in the game, like if you're um, level 40, castle level 40, and you have tier 13 troops and you're just attacking farms, you don't really have to worry about anything. Or even if you're attacking 26s and 30s, you're not really gonna have to worry about taking too many losses at all. But other than that, if you're attacking other players without using that SOS, you're going to have, you could possibly have many permanent losses. But if you're defending, if you're on the other end, and you're close to your hospital cap, you're really not going to take any, 
permanent losses. So even if someone is, you know, has five times the, the stats, the tech that you have, when they attack you, the potential for them to lose is greater than the potential for you to lose if you're smart. If you have 600,000 troops in your castle and your hospital cap is 130, the potential for you to lose is very high, right? That's not playing smart. You need to hide troops. You can hide troops in your alliance fortress. You can hide it um, with someone who is shielded, you know, by reinforcing them. You can hide troops by sending them off on a on a rally, like a long, like a 30 minute rally across the map, you know, it's gonna take them a long time to get back. Otherwise, if someone attacks you and you have a lot of troops in your castle, you're gonna take some, some big losses, right? So what happens is your hospital fills up, so that would be that 130, then there's a percentage over that, which would be stored within the sanctuary and the sanctuary your sanctuary is here in, in your hospital and it'll tell you how many troops that it can actually hold. Um, like I can hold 202,000 um, troops in my sanctuary and, and if I look over here real quick in my marching army, I can see I can have 279,000 in my hospital. So my total would be 481,000 um, that, that I could potentially hold anything over that. So if you look here, I have 758, I'm shielded, I'm fine. I have 758 home. So everything over that 40, I mean that, that 481 um, would, would, would just be permanent losses if I was zeroed. So you need to really pay attention to that. But more importantly, you, you just can't send out random attacks, especially at the beginning, and think that you're gonna be okay. I, you know, coming from another game, I just assumed that it worked the same, and it doesn't. Um, in War and Order, your attacking losses can be pretty drastic, so you need to be very careful, and that's why, you know, you need to get your SOS, that's why you need to include low-tier troops, there's certain things that you can do to impact the number of troops that you lose whenever you actually go out on an attack. All right, um, another thing. So what we like to do a lot is, you know, we have a lot of farm alliances or, you know, in Void and in Frenzy, um, you know, most alliances will open up so that we can leave our alliance, join their alliance, and, and well, mostly in void, you can um, reinforcement, reinforce them to prevent losses uh, and to gain points in the event. Uh, and the same thing goes with, with your farm alliances, so you'll leave them open so that whenever your, you know, your rival actually attacks those farms, you can leave your alliance, join those farms, reinforce them, and then that person attacking those farms takes losses, right? That's a big game we play. There are repercussions for actually doing that. For one, Elite Wars, which is one of the most important events in the game, if you, you need to be in your alliance for seven days before you can participate in it. So if you leave your alliance today, you're gonna have to wait and then come back. You're gonna have to wait seven days before you can actually participate in this event and get the rewards from it. A lot of other events are the same way, like Fortress Wars is three days. Um, you know, if you leave your, you know, if you leave your alliance there's a potential for you to actually be to miss out on events if your big players are leaving the alliance to uh, to reinforce people. The, your opponents are going to be the same. Your opponents are that you're matched with are going to be matched, assuming that those big players are up, are going to be able to participate even if they don't. 
So it's really important that you play smart as an alliance. You take this into account so that you don't miss out and you don't take losses in your events, which puts you into lower tiers where you get lower points and it's just not as much fun because you end up just playing against farms, basically. All right, number 13, keeping your farm alliances open so your teammates can catch the enemy attacking a farm is also pretty darn important, especially at the beginning when you're not really into these big events. Um, doing this is important so that it prevents your enemies or at least it makes them think before they start hitting your either your farm alliances, your academies, or your allies. All right, so one note here. When you're actually going to collect resources from your farms, you need to close that alliance that your farm's in. You need to make sure that no one from your enemy, your rival alliances is in there because the last thing you want is to send out five marches to collect from your farms and have your rival in that farm alliance reinforce your farm so you take losses. You don't want that. You definitely don't want that. All right, number 14. During void wars, have a plan with your alliance. One big thing that's happened to us a couple times is at the very beginning of the, of the event, someone will pour over to will pour over to the to the other realm to attack them when that happens no one from your alliance can actually leave your alliance so in void we like to jump over to other alliances to get points by and defend them to prevent the the enemy realm from getting points and to actually get points on the defensive side you don't do that in frenzy because you don't get very many points at all from defense. You get all of it from offense. So actually reinforcing someone during frenzy is a negative because you'll actually give them more points than you're gonna actually get from it. If you're actually gonna go, have a plan. So number 14 is during Void Wars, have a plan with your alliance so that if you're all gonna leave, and go over and do a port party in the other realm at the very beginning, which is a great strategy, go and do it. If not, don't have stragglers that jump over to the other realm and then log off, or um, they're not watching chat, or you know, then it takes them a few minutes to actually get back over to your realm so that someone can leave the alliance to help someone else. So don't do that. Always plan. Number 15, the last one, the last tip I have here, the last secret to being successful in War and Order is don't waste your Azurite. When you get to level 30, you're gonna get this Azurite mine, and Azurite is gonna be what limits you from increasing levels and getting stronger. It's gonna open up a, a new college, the Mystic College, which has some great, 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 great skills in it that you can train. It's gonna open up your um, high technology, which has some, some really good things later on to, to train that's gonna give you more tech. Um, and it's gonna allow you to actually get things like higher tier angels, higher tier troops, etc. It's going to make you much stronger. What you don't want to do is waste your Azurite. Sometimes it's really tempting to spend Azurite as you get it instead of saving up for the important things. If you're spending Azurite on high technology, especially in the lower tiers, it's honestly, it's a waste until you get further up in castle level and in troop level. So if you're spending it on high technology, instead of building up your castle or spending it on your mystic college, you're not doing the right thing. Get to level 35, that's what I would say. Get to 35, get your barracks, get your, guardi um, your guardian temple raised up, 
so that you get your tier 11 angels and your tier, you know, you already have your tier 11 um, troops, then uh, do a little mystic college training. Um, like if, especially if you're going to switch over to calf, do it at, you know, around 35 is a good time. Then go to 37, then worry about, you know, get your, and same thing, get your barracks to 37, you know, get your other buildings up to 37, then worry about your high technology. In the long run, this is the best strategy. What you don't want to do is spend all of the um, Azurite that you're getting here in high technology at the beginning where it's not going to affect your tech and not spend it on things that are going to affect your tech, are going to you know increase your ability to do well in PvP, which is the main focus in War and Order. It's war, right? You use war to create order, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, so I hope this helps. Um, let me know in the comments, you know, if you have anything else, any other secrets that can help people to be successful. Happy to hear it. Let me know. Have a great day. Take care.